Okay, welcome everyone who is joining us for today's uh, very interesting webinar. We will get started in about five minutes. So in the meantime, uh, please let us know where you are in the world. Uh, leave a message in the chat, do it to everyone so everyone can see. Uh, let us know where you're from. And uh, it's great that you're with us today. So we have Delray Beach, New York City. Florida by way of New York. It's nice. Let me just actually get our screen up here. We have England, Ohio, Queens, New Mexico, Maine, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. We have people in Toronto, Memphis, Israel. Glad you're with us. Greetings from Sing Sing, Jordan Auslander. Eli Savada in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, uh, Venice, California, Boston, Jerusalem, Israel. Austin, Texas from Brooklyn. That's Brooklyn in New York, in case anyone's wondering. Uh, Woodbridge, Connecticut. Secaucus, New Jersey. I think that's Barbara Elman, who assists, uh, who helps uh, oversee the Kahila Links project at Jewish Gen. And people in Vancouver, Springfield, Massachusetts, Vancouver in Washington. So we have Vancouver, British Columbia and Vancouver in Washington. We have people from Portland, Oregon, Baltimore. So we have people from all over the world, uh, Ron, joining us for today. Let's see who else we have here from Detroit. Ontario, Argentina, Atlanta. Okay, so welcome to everyone who's joining us today. Uh, we're about two minutes or one minute away from getting started. You could leave a message in the chat box. Let us know where you are in the world, where you're uh, participating from, and uh, and we'll get start. Uh, we'll get started in about a minute. Sally Mizrach says hello to Ron from Sally in Seattle. Uh, Montreal, Ron Ahrens has written back. Hi, Sally, in case you missed that. Okay, welcome everyone. We're, we're gonna get started in about a minute. You can just let us know where you're from in the chat box, people are writing in. So glad to see people from around the world. See Jerusalem and Toronto, Washington. We have Jane Barenbaum on the call from New York City. Jane is the head of the uh, uh, International Association of Jewish Genealogical Societies. They have a great website, iajgs.org. I encourage everybody to take a look at it. If you're not part of a Jewish Genealogical Society, you can find a listing on their website and, uh, and follow up and encourage everyone to join your local society. Um, okay, it is the two o'clock Mark, let me just stop the share here. Uh, welcome everyone, it's two o'clock, so we're gonna get started. Uh, my name is Avram Grohl, and I am privileged to uh, oversee Jewish Gen as the executive director. And we have a really wonderful presentation today with Ron Ahrens about researching criminal ancestors. Before we get started, just a couple of comments. Uh, first, as always, we will be recording the program. So if you have to jump off in the middle, uh, we'll make the recording available to you. If you're on the webinar, you should get a link today and uh, we'll publicize it to the broader community in about a week from now. And we put it on our YouTube channel. So one, please be on the lookout for the email today with the link. Uh, second, please subscribe to the Jewish Gen YouTube channel. Um, that way you can see all of our videos and, and get alerts whenever we add something new and it will just help us increase our numbers for other people to find it. Um, so please do that. Uh, also, if you're not on the discussion group, please join. You'll get uh, an opportunity to connect with thousands of people around the world and stay attuned, stay informed when we advertise new webinars, new programs, or when we make recordings available. So please join the discussion group, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, the presentation will go about 50, maybe 60 minutes today. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat in the Q&A. Um, we'll try to get to them if we can. 
um, with apologies if we can't get to everyone. Uh, please don't write in personal questions. We will not, unfortunately, be able to go through any sort of personal and provide personal research advice. Um, so please try to keep the questions in general and nature that would be uh, of interest to everybody on this meeting. Um, uh, by way of introduction, uh, Ron is a well-known uh, speaker and a genealogist. He is well known for researching criminal roots and is eminently qualified to speak on the topic. Um, by way of introduction, uh, this topic has generated a lot of feedback in terms of what do you do with this type of information. And there's been a lot of discussion over the last couple of days of when researching criminal roots, what is the purpose of it? And I think that it really uh, plays, a, it, it really goes into the larger discussion of what is the role of genealogy. And we're trying to fill in gaps in our family trees. We're trying to reconnect with relatives. We're trying to understand a little bit more about who we are. So this topic today and this type of research helps achieve all those goals. And for some of us, it might just be interesting, uh, hopefully, if you know there's no practical relevance. Um, but it's something that can have a real impact on people when they're trying to understand where they came from and, and uh, how their family has developed over time. So it is a very uh, great and important presentation. Uh, Ron is a fantastic speaker. He's funny. In fact, sometimes this presentation will be so funny it's criminal. And that's my poor attempt at humor. And so without further ado, we will pass it over to Ron. Thank you, Avrami. Avrami, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, perfectly. OK, so welcome to everyone from wherever you are around the world. So I have a very long presentation. I'm going to try to keep it to an hour, but uh, I think Avrami was a little bit surprised when he saw how many slides I have. So I'm going to go at a New York City clip. So the agenda for today is to discuss the various different types of records that are available for criminal research. I'm going to show you by example the records that can be found. I'm going to discuss where to find these records. Many of them are online, but there's much more offline. I'm also going to talk about research considerations and methodology. But my goal is to encourage you to research these people rather than to avoid them. So there are, in my humble opinion, about seven different categories of criminal records prison records, court records, pardon and parole records, execution information, investigative files, and police files. But other genealogical records that you would normally use in researching anyone else are also appropriate for doing criminal research, specifically newspapers, census records, vital records, city directories, and voter registration records. Now I've come up with this little diagram, which I call the cycle of criminal oriented records. Start at 12 o'clock and there's a crime or attempt a crime going clockwise. There may be investigations. So that may lead to investigative or police files continuing around to about five o'clock. There are criminal trials, which would lead to criminal court documents continuing on. If the person is convicted, there might be uh, prison records, you might find the person behind bars in the census. There are also city directories where you could do negative research to see whether or not a person was actually living where you think they should be, or if they're not, maybe they're incarcerated behind bars somewhere. Then if they return to society or not, there may be partner or parole records. And once again, there are execution records. And you can go around if a person is a repeat offender, the person may go around and around in this circle. I want to emphasize there are different criminal jurisdictions. There are federal crimes, there are state crimes, there are local crimes. And as a result, you have to look at different places. So if you know someone who was a criminal and are researching someone as a criminal, you really have to understand where was the, the crime committed and what type of jurisdiction was the crime conducted in. That will lead you in different directions. Case studies. 
I'll start off with my own ancestor, Isaac Spear, also known as Joseph Spear, also known as Herbert Edward Spear, also known as my great grandfather. Now, I started my research more than 20 years ago, and the first record I ever found about him was this Soundex index card from the 1920 US federal census. It's pretty innocuous on its own. It shows one Isaac Spear in the upper left hand corner, having been born in New York. It shows his wife, my great grandmother Ida, my grandfather Sidney, and his siblings Lillian and David. The next record I found was the marriage certificate for my great grandparents. It shows Isaac Spear and Ida Tarshis, both living at 267 20th Street in Brooklyn. It also shows that, according to this document, my great grandfather was not born in New York, but rather in London, England. The next record I collected care of my aunt was my grandfather's birth certificate, which shows that his father, when Isaac Spear, was not born in New York, not born in London, but somewhere else in England, specifically Hanley, Staffordshire. So right off the bat, I was a little bit confused. I had a great grandfather who could uh, outdo Harry Houdini. Harry could, Houdini could break out of suitcases and handcuffs, but Harry Houdini never figured out a way to be born in three different locations. According to my grandfather's birth certificate, he was born on May 30th, 1895. Moving on. <laughs> okay, getting a call from my pharmacy. So I looked in the 1900 US federal census and I found a record for an Isaac Spear having been born in Pennsylvania. A fourth location. I'm going to. Sorry about that. <sighs> Sorry about that. So. Here is the 1900 US federal census showing one Isaac Spear having been born in Pennsylvania and enumerated as an inmate at Sing Sing. So now I have a great grandfather who possibly was behind bars at Sing Sing and was born in four different locations. So I wondered, uh, I called up Sing Sing prison. They told me that they didn't have the records that I should really contact the New York State Archives and I called the archives and I said, do you have the records? They said, yes, we have the records. And uh, if you want to look at them, we'll get them out. They said, please get them out because I'm taking the next American Airlines flight across the country. I want to see them. Furthermore, the archivist told me that there were about 300 admissions to the prison every year in that time frame. So I multiplied uh, five years, uh, which is the difference between when my great grandfather was born and the 1900 US federal census. <laughs> so I multiply five and 1900 when my great grandfather was behind bars at Sing Sing. So that would be five years of admissions to search. I multiply five years by 300 admissions. That came out to 1,500 records. I divide that by eight hours, divide that by 60 minutes per hour. And that came to three minutes per, three records per minute or one record every 20 seconds. I gave myself one day and I concluded this could be done. So I went to New York State Archives uh, for one day and one day only. And in the first hour, I found this record from 1897 shows one Isaac Spear, alias Herbert Edward Spear, on charges of bigamy. It's an incredible record. It shows the judge in the case, William B. Hurd. It shows that my great grandfather was born in England. I knew this was my guy because the list, the name of his nearest relative, which was Ida Spear, his wife, living at 267 20th Street, the same address as the marriage certificate I showed you previously. My brother suggests I contact the Kings County Courthouse because he was convinced they would have more information. And I called the courthouse and whoever was at the end of the line was also curious about what was going on with Isaac. 
And he went to the bowels of that building and about a week later received an envelope with this little piece of paper in it, which is a copy of the Kings County clerk's notebook. And unlike this, the admissions record, which had this number 4-0 to the left of the word bigamy, this had the term of four years spelled out at the very bottom right-hand corner of the Kings County clerk's notebook. So that's what I, I learned that what was 4.0 on the admissions record. Furthermore, the person at the Kings County Courthouse had just like contacted the New York City Municipal Archives because he was sure there might be a case file about this. And after about six months of handing then director of the New York City Municipal Archives, Ken Cobb, I received a phone call that they had indeed found the court case for my great grandfather. Now, my great grandfather was put on the stand and he was asked in no uncertain terms, was he married to my great grandmother by Rabbi Ettinger? And on the bottom of this page, it says, were you married by him, Rabbi Ettinger? And my great grandfather said, I can't recollect. I don't recognize that woman in the red dress across the courthouse or the courtroom. Now, years before the internet, uh, I would find a couple of different articles about what happened in that courthouse. Both of his wives showed up at the courthouse, one complaining of abandonment, the other complaining of bigamy. This is one of my favorite articles from the Brooklyn Citizen, which was one of the two most popular newspapers in Brooklyn at the time. The title is Spears, Many Wives, Two Were in Court, and There Are Others, The Police Say. The son of a well-known rabbi in the lower left-hand corner, it reads, Spear is 24 years old, and if reports about him are true, he has at least four wives. And what's really important to me is the last paragraph on the lower right-hand side of this article, because I have yet to find the photograph of my great-grandfather. Well, let me read this to you. There, the two wives met, and one of the most dramatic incidents which ever took place in that police station was enacted. Spear repudiated his lawful wife. He declared he had never seen her before. He wilted when his father-in-law held up Spear's two-year-old boy, my grandfather, Sidney, who is an exact image of the prisoner. So that gives me some indication of what my great-grandfather looked like. Years ago, I walked around the New York City Public Library and I came across a two-volume set called the New York Times Personal Name Index. And I looked for an Isaac Spear. I didn't find anything, but I did find an article about a Joseph Spear who in 1925 was arrested on charges of attempted extortion. Uh, this is a little bit out of uh, order. This is actually a discharge record from Sing Sing. And my great-grandfather got out of Sing Sing after three years of serving time there. He didn't do the full term of four years. And here's another type of record. This is an application for uh, executive clemency from the governor of New York. My great grandfather did uh, marry again, uh, even though he was still married to my great grandmother at the time, he was a serial bigamist. So he got married in Buffalo, New York in 1921 three weeks after he passed the civil service exam qualifying him to be a New York State income tax auditor. So it shows uh, that his name was Joseph Spear, who's from Brooklyn. He was an auditor. He was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania, which ties in with other documents I have about him. And so there are things about him that are true that I know about my great grandfather. There are things on this document that are absolute lies, but they tie into lies on other documents. Here's my great grandfather listed twice in the 1925 New York State Census. The first uh, listing is with my great grandfather, uh, and the second was with his third wife. Now, here is a court document that I found at National Archives in New York City, and this is for a guy named Isaac Spear. And this is actually not my Isaac Spear, but it happens to belong to uh, Eli Savada, who's in our audience today. And this Isaac Spear was actually on trial for patent infringement. Uh, 
I would go back and find in 1900, uh, this is actually at Eli's Isaac Spear, who would, uh, this Isaac Spear was a furrier and it would make sense that a furrier would be involved with a patent infringement case having to do with uh, taking hairs out of animal pelts. So researching then and now 20 years ago, it was very difficult. I had to check the census by hand. New York Times personal name index was not available online. It was new, no keyword search. The Brooklyn Daily Eagle was via available via interlibrary loan. And it was only one linear process to go through to get where I wound up. Today, it would be much easier. The census is online and indexed. Newspapers are online. There are multiple starting points today, many, many more records available, but still is the case you have to visit local repositories to get certain records that are not online. They have not been digitized yet. Second case is a guy named Harry Horowitz, also known as Jip the Blood. He was called Jip the Blood either because of his uh, darker complexion, he looked like a gypsy, or because he was a dapper dresser. Now, Harry was one of many people who went on trial uh, in the 19 teens for the slaying of a gambling casino operator by the name of Herman Rosenthal. It included a corrupt New York City police officer named Charles Becker. And I would find multiple cases about this. In fact, there were trial transcripts that were actually found in a dumpster in New York City and someone reclaim them and turn them over to John Jay School of Criminal Justice. And they have these two cases. So here we have Jip the Blood, case 3198 and case 3200. And this is in fact about Harry Horowitz. These cases are just thousands of pages long. Here's the Sing C emissions record for Harry Horowitz. And this lists his wife, Lillian. So I went looking for uh, the right Harry Horowitz. Uh, Harry Horowitz just happens to be, as you can surmise or guess, is a very common name, but I narrowed down the possibilities. And ultimately I would find a Harry Horowitz who is married to a Lillian, which in turn gives me the name as the father. And then I can do more research on Harry and his family. Case three, one of the most, one of the worst criminals ever was a guy named Louis Buckhalter, also known as Louis Lepke Buckhalter. He led something called Murder Incorporated, which we'll get back to at the very end of this presentation. He was a board member of the syndicate, which involved Italian criminals, Jewish criminals, lots of other criminals. He controlled many different unions, most notably the garment industry union. He came from a blended family by three different families melded together. And he was on the younger side, so he probably did not get the attention he required. This is his Sing Sing emissions record. By the 1930s and 1940s, the Sing Sing emissions registers were really massive. They are heavy. They're about 20 or 30 pounds. They're just monsters. And I went through them and at the bottom, it also gives you uh, a listing of their previous criminal history. They're just loaded, chock full of information. This is from uh, the FBI file for Harry Strauss, who was one of Louis Lucky Buckhalter's associates. And this has a lot of information. This has all of, or many of Louis Buckhalter's aliases, Lepke, Louis Bucker, Halter, Louis Kavar, uh, Louis Buckholtz, Lepke, Lefty, Sefty, Louis Brodsky, Louis Kavar, Judge Lewis, the judge, Judge Louis, Judge Brodsky. It has his, uh, his height, his weight. He was of Jewish descent. He went to grammar school. He had an appendicitis operation scar. It goes into his family background. Uh, talks about his parents. They, he had an excellent father and mother. Father died in 1910. Mother was refined and well-educated. 
One sister is a school teacher, one brother is a rabbi with a PhD, one brother, stepbrother is a dentist. So just a lot of chock full of information that you can get from these documents. I love this page, personal characteristics. Nose large, rather straight and blunt, ears prominent, eyes alert and shifty, has a habit of passing change from one hand to another, believed to wear a yellow gold ring on the small finger of his left hand set with a large cat eye stone. It just goes on in incredible detail. You don't find in normal, normal genealogical documents. Now the New York City Police Department used what were called yellow sheets. They wrote out their reports on yellow pieces of paper. So this is uh, a yellow sheet I found at the New York City Municipal Archives in Manhattan. And it talks about Louis Lefty Ball Coulter walking around with subject number B40317, uh, who was unknown, but they went to Schleifer's restaurant and number to Lafayette Street in Manhattan. Now, who's this B40317? I'm gonna show you three different ways how I figured that out. It happened to be one Jacob Shapiro, who was Lepke Buckhalter's right-hand man. So here we have from the FBI file for Lewis Buckhalter on the left. It gives you details about Jacob Shapiro. Here's a, a mugshot I found about Jacob Shapiro on mugshots.com. And Jacob Shapiro himself not only served time at Sing Sing, but he also served time at the New York State Reformatory at Elmira. And it has his number here. So all these different documents have the same B40317 identifying number for this criminal. More from Lewis Buckhalter's uh, FBI file. So it talks about his wife prior to her marriage. Betty Buckhalter was employed as a nightclub hostess. Uh, and she was hired by Ben Marin, who managed the Palais Royale and other nightclubs in New York and goes on and on and on. Here's the discussion of Louis Lepke Buckhalter's quote unquote business interests. He had a bunch of different companies that he was involved with. Uh, they mostly had names having to do with clothing, like the Garfield Express Company, the Pioneer Coat Front Company, the Perfection Coat Front Company, and so on and so on. Here's a, a court case file that I actually got by going into the bowels of a Los Angeles County archives. It's in the basement of that building. And this is from a court case uh, where Lewis Buckhalter, Bugsy Siegel, and a whole bunch of other people were charged with the murder of uh, Harry Big Greeny Greenberg. And if you remember from the movie Bugsy, Bugsy Siegel went to a train track and shot Greeny Greenberg dead. And this is a court case about that incident. There's information about Louis Lepke Buckhalter on the FBI website, at least there was when I took a screenshot of it. And ultimately, Louis Lepke Buckhalter and two others, two associates were accused of killing a candy store operated by the name of Joseph Rosen. Here's actually a picture of Joseph Rosen on the floor after he was shot to death. This is care of the John Jay School of Criminal Justice in Manhattan. This is also from the FBI file for Lepke. This is a wanted poster, wanted dead or alive, $25,000 award, reward. There's even a, a court case where Louis Lepke Buckhalter, Mendy Weiss and Louis Capone all tried to get stays for their executions at Sing Sing Prison. I found this on a law website called finelaw.com. Just lots of different places to go looking for information, especially if they were big name criminals. Also at the John Jay School of Criminal Justice, they had some uh, 
letters from his wife, Betty. So I'm just going to read the last uh, portion of this letter. She finishes off the letter saying, all my love and believe me, dearest, you're everything in the world to me. So buck up, chin up, keep well, always lovingly, your own Betty. And then a bunch of kisses at the end of that. Going back to New York State Archives in Albany, they have some inmate case files for those people who were electrocuted in the electric chair at Sing Sing. Now, you may or may not know that if you stick your finger into your wall socket, you might be shocked a little bit. That's uh, rated at one amp, but they weren't messing around with the electric chair. When you got into the electric chair and they pulled the, the lever, you were shocked with 10 or 11 amps, which is truly uh, way more than enough to fry you. And that they actually had a hole in the ceiling of the death house, which housed the electric chair so that the smoke from the person being electrocuted could escape. Case number four, William Greenberg. Now, uh, every year at the Academy Awards, a lot of the actresses wear jewelry from Harry Winston. Well, Harry Winston's real name was William Greenberg. In 1920, there was a thief who stole $45,000 worth of diamonds from William Greenberg. And this is a, a criminal I'm gonna research next. He too served time in Sing Sing. Here's his Sing Sing emissions record. There is a case file for him at the New York City Municipal Archives. It's really hard to find case files in this index. It's very low resolution, really, really, really hard to see. So I'm gonna blow this up, but this is the same William Greenberg. Next case is a criminal named Mickey Cohen, not Michael Cohen, who is the attorney for Donald Trump, but Mickey Cohen, who is Bugsy Siegel's right-hand man. And he had an interesting childhood. He was a pugilist. This is from uh, the Alcatraz inmate case file. Here, here's more about his being a pugilist. Uh, this is also from the Alcatraz inmate case file. It has a, a lot of information about him. He's 5'6", weighed 164 pounds, blood pressure 140 over 90. He had a couple of uh, sexually transmitted diseases, something you don't normally find on his genealogical document, but here you have it. Now he had a girlfriend, uh, either by the name of Sandy uh, Hagen or Claretta Hashigan. I think she went by two names herself. So here's a letter he wrote to her from behind bars at Alcatraz. Now, he also served time at the Federal Penitentiary in Atlanta. And according to this document, he was hit in the head with a pipe. And here's more information about that incident. Uh, that he was struck on the head with a pipe. Something you normally don't see. This is actually an x-ray of his, his head, which shows the metal plate that was put into his head to hold his head together after being hit in the head with a pipe. Now, he was a prolific writer. He wrote letters to almost everyone. He was also friendly with Sammy Davis Jr. And he wrote to a bunch of people. He wrote lots of letters to his uh, brother, Harry. Here's more about Mickey Cohen and his psychological testing. Let me just read some of this to you. I'm going to read the last paragraph at the bottom. Mr. Cohen is a very poorly educated man uh, from a deprived social cultural background on the basis of seven WAIS subtests. He has attained an estimated full scale IQ of 80. That's not very high. And a verbal IQ score of 81. So back to his letters, he was writing, uh, complaining to the doctor uh, uh, wherever he was incarcerated, saying that he didn't have enough time to take care of business in the bathroom, that due, who, due to his 
physical condition, he really needed more time. So here's one letter that he wrote about that topic. Here's another letter that he wrote about being a victim of anti-Semitism while being incarcerated. Just the things you don't find in normal genealogical documents. Here is a letter that his brother, Harry Cohen, wrote to John Mitchell, who is a US attorney for the United States. And he tried to get his brother, Mickey, out of jail. Last major case I'm gonna discuss is a guy named Irving Wexler, who's also known as Waxy Gordon. And possibly he got that name because he was a good pickpocket. And they said that he could pick your pocket as if your pockets were lined with wax. Now he was a disciple, a member of Benny Fine's gang. He was a bootlegger. He's the only person in American criminal history, Jewish or other, who served time in Sing Sing, Alcatraz and Leavenworth. If that wasn't enough, he served three terms in the New York State Reformatory at, in Elmira. He served time at Attica. He served time at Auburn Prison. He served two terms at the U.S. Federal Penitentiary in Atlanta. He also served time at the U.S. Federal Penitentiary in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. And he also served time in jails in Boston and Philadelphia. Here is his admissions record to Elmira. And these are fantastic records for a couple of reasons. One is that it actually shows you the family structure. It gives gives his uh, parents' names and his siblings' names. More importantly, it has photographs. Now, this is kind of rare. I haven't seen this in too many sets of records. Elmira certainly has that. And the records for Folsom Prison here in California also have pictures. But this is uh, pretty rare to find photographs. This is also a listing of his other infractions against the law. Just remarkable. These are fantastic. Fantastic records. He also by the name, went by the name of Harry Middleton. So here I found him in the 1910 federal census living in Philadelphia. He was uh, incarcerated uh, at the Philadelphia County Prison. Now there's another set of records uh, which I found in Jerusalem, but they were originally from New York. And they're from the Judah Magnus collection, but they are found at the Central Archives for the History of Jewish People in Jerusalem. And here's a, an, uh, a little article written by Abe Schoenfeld, one of the lead detectives or investigators for the, the group. And it, it talks about Harry Waxigorin, a, a dealer, a Jew. And it talks about his association with Dopey Benny Fine. Here is Irving Wexler's admissions to Sing Sing in 1915. He went by multiple different names, Harry Brown, Benjamin Lustig, Louis Wexler, Waxy Gorin. Here is his previous commitments on the bottom. He also served time, as I said before, in Leavenworth. Uh, once again, another Sing Sing Admissions record. This is in 1951. And at the bottom of that record, it shows that he served three terms at Elmira, Sing Sing beforehand, Lewisburg, Atlanta, Leavenworth, back to Atlanta. Now, many of you may know Hadassi Lipsius. Uh, her relative wrote an article about putting the finger on Waxy Gorin, and Hadassi's relative, Morris Lipsius, actually put the finger on, led the feds to finding Waxy Gorin so that they could arrest him. This article is found in the Saturday Evening Post of February 23rd, 1952. Now here's a New York Times article saying that Waxy Gorin died in Alcatraz at age 63, and he was waiting to go on trial in Los Angeles, but he never got to the trial. He died in Sing Sing. Here's his death certificate showing that he died in Alcatraz Island. But if you look up the list of people who are 
who were incarcerated in Alcatraz between 1934 and 1963. This guy's not on the list. But fortunately, there's another set of files called the Notorious Offender Files at the National Archives in College Park, Maryland. And who do they have files for? None other than Lewis Buckhalter and Irving Waxigorn Wexler. So this is from his Notorious Offender file. It gives information about his family, his siblings, lots of juicy details. Uh, I'm going to skip through that. So then I found him in the 1900 uh, federal census, and I believe his name wasn't even uh, Isaac uh, Irving. It was Isaac. And that, I believe, is his real name. Same thing in the 1905 U.S. Sorry, 1905 New York census. Same family but he went by the name of Isaac. So I wrote to the FBI, asked them if they had inf any information about Irving Wexler. And they said, well, at some point in time, we had four files, but two files were destroyed. The third file uh, may be re quote unquote responsive and it's maintained a microfilm, but it's almost totally illegible. And they've attempted to find the last file, but they could not find it. So I want to summarize these four cases that I looked at a bunch of different types of records, uh, admissions records to prisons, vital records, census records, court transcripts, FBI files, other files from National Archives, newspapers, and other. And I didn't find all these types of records for each of these individuals, but across these criminals, I found many different types of records for each of them. What's probably more instructive is that there's no general way to research any given criminal. I, I went in different directions to, to research each criminal. I would find one document, and that was not always the same document to start off my journey for each of these criminals. I would find something and then go across these different types of records to find more about them. Female criminals. So, Right near Sing Sing is a, a correctional facility called Bedford Hills. And there are uh, inmate case files at the New York State Archives in Albany about those women who serve time. There are a couple of different sets of records about women involved in prostitution in New York City. First of all, there's the Lillian Wall collection of papers I found at Columbia University. And there's another special collection called the Committee of 14 Papers found in the Special Collections Department of the New York Public, Public Library on 42nd Street. Here's an example from the Lillian Wall Collection. Uh, talks about an Annie Green who was arrested on disorderly conduct. She was a Jewess. She was arrested twice before. It goes on and on. It also talks about different addresses in New York City. Let's see, 116 West 27th Street. There were five cadets. Those were the recruiters, and there were nine girls in both houses, uh, six in company, mostly Jewish. So lots of information about Jewish women who were involved in prostitution. This is from the Committee of 14 records. There were night court records showing lots of different people, and I picked out four cards that had names that sounded Jewish to me, including Lillian Wasser, Fanny Cohen, Sadie Cohen, uh, Sarah Adler and Rosie Goldstein. Going back to the New York State Archives in Albany, they have uh, female inmates who serve time at the state prison for women. Here's an example of a woman named Celia Celie Berger, who's convicted of arson in the third degree. She was from Russia. Here's another one for Rose Goldberg, who was charged with attempted burglary in the third degree. She was from Romania. There's also a facility called uh, House of Refuge on Randall's Island in New York. And here's an example of a woman named Rosie Prince. She was a Hebrew. Especially collections 
I want to spend some time on this. Before fingerprints, there was something called a Bertillon card, named after the French criminologist Alphonse Bertillon, who came up with a series of measurements, your nose, your ears, your eyes, your arms, your legs. And those were put on a card along with a photograph of you. Now, if you're lucky enough to find a Bertillon card, uh, you're better than I am. There's, there's probably a Bertillon card from my great grandfather, but I've never been able to find it because there are not that many Bertillon cards available. Skip that, skip that. So where to find records? Once again, they're held at the federal, state, and local level. There's no standard scheme for storing and cataloging them. All states, all locales are different. There are different privacy and access restrictions depending on the jurisdiction. Most criminal records still are in hard copy or in microfilm format, which means you need to visit someplace. Federal records. There were five original federal penitentiaries. Now there are, I think, about 60 different federal correctional facilities across the country. Uh, there is the Federal Bureau of Prisons Lookup. Uh, you can look up someone who's been there since, I think, the early 1980s. This is an example of a high school classmate of mine who served time in a federal correctional facility. The National Archives has records for those original correction facilities, Alcatraz, Atlanta, Leavenworth, and McNeil Island in Washington State. Here's an index of uh, inmates who are at Leavenworth, and those files are at the National Archives, I think, in Kansas City. Let's see. So if you want to file a Freedom of Information Act form, I think you no longer uh, have to fill out form G639. I think you can fill out a form directly online at the FBI website. State records, I'm gonna skip through this. Steve Morris actually has a inmate locator one-step tool for the New York State Department of Corrections, which I asked them to build. Here's an example of looking up uh, someone in that database. Let's skip through these. You can look for local court cases. Uh, New York State has New York State criminal cases in the database at courts.state.newyork.us. Local records, I'm gonna skip that. Uh, tips and recommendations. Ask family members for information first. Do not be afraid to ask. if. Family members don't help, don't stop. Uh, where there's uh, smoke, there's fire. And I believe where there's resistance, there's likely dirt. Work with the most common records first, census records, newspapers. If you're lucky enough to find your relative that way, then you're way ahead of the rest of us. The goal is to find a specific event, a crime or a trial and a specific date uh, and a range of time as well as the location. It's really important to find a location so you know which jur jurisdiction to go looking for records. Let's see. So I'm going to close out a little bit by saying I have two books on this subject. I spent about nearly a decade writing my first book, The Jews of Sing Sing, which is a compendium of a dozen mini biographies about some of the people I've discussed today, as well as some others, but in the process, you'll learn a lot about Jewish criminal history, as well as how to do genealogical research on criminal ancestors. I also have a reference book called Wanted U.S. Criminal Records. Both are available on my website. On my website, there's also access to a database of more than 6,000 individuals who were Jewish and served time up the river at Sing Sing Prison. I typed in uh, the name Abe Mir because I was contacted this past week by a woman in Berkeley by the name of Della Dash, who I think hopefully is in the audience today. And she asked me to tell her more about her relative. So sure enough, he's in my database. And if the person's in the database, then I have a photograph of that admissions record to Sing Sing. So here is Abe's admissions record to Sing Sing in 1933. He was all of 19 years of age at the time. There are many newspapers articles about Abraham Mir, and he was shot to death two years later in 1935. 
And according to this, he was associated uh, with Louis Pretty Boy Amberg. There were uh, the Amberg brothers. We'll get to that in a second. I typed, I went to Google Books and typed in Abraham Mir at the top and bingo. I saw that Abraham Mir is actually in the book that I own, but I found this much more easily by typing in Abraham Mir into Google Books search engine. And here's a book written years ago by Alan Block called East Side, West Side, Organizing Crime in New York, 1930-1950. Also on Google Books, I found two other books that mention Abe Mir by name. I found out more about uh, Joseph Amberg on Wikipedia. Uh, here's another article from the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. Uh, and I'll just read this to you. Among the victims in the Brownsville War was one of Dutch Schultz's lieutenants, Abraham Meir, who was shot in front of 405 Thatford Avenue on September 5th, only two weeks before Joe Amberg was slain. Here's a book about Louis Pretty Boy Amberg and the Brooklyn Loan Sharking War. This is available on Amazon. Uh, I found a website called gangsterreport.com, which talks about the top five Jewish mob hits of all time. And number one on the list is Stud Schultz, for whom Abraham Meir worked for, and Joe Amberg, who's number three on that list of top five hits of all time. And here's another article from the New York Daily News. Meir was a Bronx boy, and he was uh, he had worked for Dutch Schultz. So I'm going to summarize this, that there were three major gangs in New York, and one was called Murder Incorporated, and that involved Louis Lefke Buckhalter, Jacob Shapiro, both of whom I've already discussed. I've also shown you that Harry Pittsburgh, Phil Strauss, and Mendy Weiss also joined Louis Lefke Buckhalter being electrocuted in the electric chair at Sing Sing. In the upper right-hand corner, we have uh, Louis and Joseph Amberg. They died in 1935. And we have Abe Meir working for Dutch Schultz. Abe Meir died September 15, 1935. And we have Irv Amron, who was also shot with Abe Meir the same day. And we had Dutch Schultz, who was uh, killed just one month after Abe Meir passed away. Another email came in this past week from Donna Halper, who's a professor in Massachusetts. And she was looking for information about a female relative who served time at the Alderson Federal Correctional Facility in West Virginia. So my answer to her is, where was the crime committed? I didn't know until this week that the federal penitentiary in Alderson, West Virginia was built in the 1920s, and it was the first federal prison for women. So I would suggest to Donna that she look for a federal court case at some regional National Archives facility, but you really have to know where the crime is committed to hopefully find out where the trial was uh, located. And if so, then you go to the regional National Archives facility that would house those records. So for West Virginia, for example, West Virginia records are housed at the National Archives in Philadelphia, which unfortunately is closed right now due to COVID-19. And I think I'm I beat the gun and I'm ready for questions. Okay, Ron, thank you so much. That was so interesting and informative. Um, I think what we'll do, Ron, if this is okay with you, um, we'll ask people just to post in the Q&A and then you can take a look at them and see which ones you think uh, we should read aloud and, and respond to. Um, we do have a lot of, uh, questions with regard to personal research, which we're not going to be able to do, um, and some questions that are related to general research, which we're not going to focus on. But if anybody has specific questions for Ron, that would be um, of general interest, please post them in the Q&A, um, and then we'll try to go through them. We're all a lot here. There are lots of people posting here. Okay. So unfortunately, there is no handout, but the Avrami told me that this is going to this is being recorded. Yes, Avrami. Yes. So there, you'll be able to review this 
over and over again. Interesting question about transgenerational trauma. That's a whole other subject which I can go into because I've, I've uh, explored what's called family uh, systems theory and I have explored how my great grandfather's transgressions has had an impact on me. And let me just tell you one story. So when I was growing up, I went to my grandparents' house in Brooklyn and for some reason I said, you know, I, I better be a good boy today because otherwise you'll have to show me and throw me into Sing Sing. And she pulled me aside in very stern words, said, don't you dare use the word Sing Sing in front of your grandfather. That will really anger him. But now understanding that my great grandfather served time in Sing Sing, there was a reason why my grandmother said that. So this is really, truly extended psychotherapy that it, understanding my great grandfather's life helps me understand events in my childhood that I had no clue of uh, when I was younger. Someone said, we all have skeletons in our closet. I would venture to say most families have a, a criminal in their family. You just have to look hard enough to find one. Looking for research sources for Jewish mafia in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, Max Weinberg, uh, I would contact the FBI, look in lots of books. Hopefully I've given you lots of examples of where to look. Are the records in Peru? I, I don't know much about doing research out of this country. Someone said their grandfather was involved with crimes of prohibition. I'm actually working on a, a presentation for the Ohio Genealogical Society Conference in April on prohibition in Ohio. Maybe I'll know more by the end of April. Uh, Ron, here's a question uh, from Dan Oren. Yeah. Uh, have you interviewed any criminals in doing this research and have they given you any specific useful tips for wow. genealogy? Wow, interesting question. <laughs> Somehow someone got my name and he was in, I think he was a two-time sex offender in Sing Sing and I went to actually visit him. Other than that, I, I, I'll answer a question a different way. I haven't had much experience both you're talking to criminals themselves, but I have called up members of the family of other criminals and maybe given them some news that they did not know about. So that's an interesting experience. And I think there's maybe a way to do that delicately so you don't totally blow their brains away. Uh, but it, it's very helpful in the research if you can get a relative of a criminal to talk to. Uh, well, with that in mind, I did actually meet the daughter of Irving Wexler. She lived in Philadelphia and I, I got to meet her. So that was interesting. She had claimed, of course, that her father was completely innocent of all charges against them, even though he's the only criminal in American history to have served time in Sing Sing Alcatraz and Leavenworth, a pretty good track record. But of course she believed he was innocent. Hmm. Any others you want to pick out? Rami, I'm going through, there's a lot here. Yeah, um, everyone, please post on the on the QA if you could. Uh, so one question, which is somewhat related, an ancestor was institutionalized. So mental health records are much more difficult to get a hold of. And actually, Steve Luxenberg, who spoke at the IAJGS conference a number of years ago, wrote a book about his aunt Annie, called Annie's Ghost, and I highly recommend that you read that book, but he got around the restrictions of access by looking for a court case that basically allowed family members to put the relative behind doors uh, in a mental institution. So, but generally speaking, those mental institution records are very difficult to get access to. Okay. Uh, do you see any other questions you want to pull out? How much does it cost to track down these documents? Oh boy, that is a loaded question. 
Well, with the advent of the internet, many of these are much easier to find than uh, during my journey. So I, I, I can't even begin to calculate the cost of what I spent to do my research, but it's gotten a lot easier. That's the good news for the rest of you. Okay. Um, okay, do you see any others that you wanna pull out? I'm, I'm uh, scrolling down, I'm, I'm maybe halfway through the list, there's so much here. <laughs> any way for you to uh, copy the text file or maybe I can get back to some people? Um, uh, it's, it's hard, to, they don't even know who's on, who's right. Bob L. Okay, you know what we'll do? Um, let's wrap up here. And everybody, we're gonna send out a follow-up email, which will have a link to the recording of today's presentation um, and a link to register for the next webinar. But what I'll do is I'll also create a form whereby you can submit a question. Um, submit a question, leave your email address, and then Ron will go through some of them uh, and see what he can respond to. Ron, is that, does that work? Uh, just so everyone understands, I'm not going to get back to everyone because uh, I have a limited amount of time and uh, I certainly can't, can't do individual research uh, for no money. It, that, that, that's not fair. But if there's a general question, uh, I'm more than happy to do that. But I, I, I can't do extensive individual research for people. Right. Okay. So thank you. So again, we'll send it out. Please keep your questions general. And as Ron said, he'll try to go through some of them. Um, Ron, thank you very much. This was really interesting and uh, informative and can really help a lot of people. Um, as I mentioned, the session was recorded. We'll send out an email later today with a link to view it on our YouTube channel. Um, and as I said at the beginning, please subscribe to the Jewish Gen YouTube channel and make sure you're on our discussion group so you can stay informed of similar presentations like this uh, in the future. And I just want to, um, I just want to highlight our next presentation, which won't take place uh, next week, uh, which is Hanukkah, but it will take place the following week on uh, December eighth. And our speaker will be Jennifer Mendelson, and she will uh, talk about using DNA for your research with a specific focus on. Um, how to make sense of your Ashkenazic Jewish DNA results. So we will include a link. Um, we will include a link to sign up for that talk uh, later today. And that will be the first in a four part series of DNA, uh, of talks that are focused on DNA, both on a basic level and a more advanced level. So we hope you will uh, participate in that. So thank you to everyone again for joining us today. Ron, thank you again for this wonderful presentation. For everyone in the United States, we wish you a happy Thanksgiving. And for everyone around the world, we wish you uh, a happy Hanukkah. Take care.